big news. I'm listening. What do you got? Critics and parents agree. Paw Patrol, the mighty movie, is hilarious, action-packed, and fun for the whole family. How do you like me now? That's what I'm talking about. Paw Patrol, the mighty movie, rated PG, now streaming on Paramount+. Plus. Hi, everybody. This is Brian Clem from Suburban Legends, and you are listening to my weekly mixtape with the very handsome Brian Colbert. I have a crush. You have a crush. Let's have a crush together. Tune in. Welcome to My Weekly Mixtape, a podcast that takes the classic mixtape approach to building a modern playlist. I'm your host, Brian Colburn. Joining me as guest curator tonight is Brian Clem, guitarist for the fantastic ska punk band Suburban Legends. Brian, mm. thank you so much for joining me on My Weekly Mixtape. Thank you for saying fantastic. I mean, it's uh, normally it's just the band name, but we don't get a we don't get a congratulations in the beginning of it. So thank you. <laughs> First things first, I want to let the listeners out there know that, yes, this is a Songs of Disney episode. However, Suburban Legends are a ska punk band. So while some of the topics tonight obviously are going to be completely family friendly, some of them might not. So for the parents out there, if your kids are around, I would suggest giving this a listen without them first and then deciding for yourself if you want to play it for the kiddos. Now, Brian, as a first time guest, I'd like to start by asking you the same question I ask all of my first time guests. And that is, what does the word mixtape mean to you? Oh, dude, that's a heavy thing because listening to your other podcast, because I'm a fan now. Oh, awesome. I had some time to do some like thinking about the mixtape thing. And the first mixtape I ever got, I still have it. Sarah 1999, 2000, we started dating at the very end of high school and she was Mormon and she was going away to school. So it was bad timing for us to get wrapped up. But anyway, she was like kind of like an emo kid, but she didn't look like it back then. She was just an adorable flipped out, cute A-frame dresses and stuff. And I came back to my car because I have a 54 Bel Air and it was in the process of restoring it. I was 17 or 18 and she had left it in my car because she knew it was unlocked. Because the locks weren't working. <laughs> and it was my first mixtape. And it was so cute. And she put all the little, all the bands and everything and wrote cute little messages and hearts and stuff. And I swooned hard. I'd never gotten a mixtape before. And I listened to that mixtape a thousand times. And that's where I got introduced to The Promise Ring, The Get Up Kids, uh, Reggie and the Full Effects, Sunday Day Real Estate. But it was my introduction to that because I was in the ska band in high school. And I listened to blues and i was in a ska band i didn't listen to ska that much and i would just started getting into ska after i joined suburban legends and it just meant the world to me because i was so smitten by this girl we didn't get a chance to date very long because it was at the very end of high school literally we went to prom together and we went on a couple of dates and then she went away to school heartbroken just like oh <laughs> but maybe it was for the better because i knew what it was kind of like to have a cute relationship like that and have my heart broken but in a cute soft way but i still have that mixtape and i made her one back and i put on what there what i was into at the time and i just got into the impossibles i don't know if you know who they are the impossibles ultimate fake book and i, I put like kind of like power pop and ska on one side of band called that i was obsessed with slow gherkin they were okay. our first band we ever toured with and on the other side was a bunch of blues probably didn't care about awesome Tonight, we're talking about a topic that's been heavily requested since I started this show, and that's an episode that's dedicated to the songs of Disney, be it from movies, TV shows, you name it. So the listeners out there might be asking themselves, so why is there a member of a ska punk band as your guest curator? And that's where, Brian, I'm going to kindly ask you to talk about Suburban Legends' connection to Disney and its music over the years. Oh man, well that that goes down real deep because my band, as we yeah. were best friends, I, I mean the lead singer Vince Walker is my best friend. He's been my best friend since I was like thirteen or fourteen, and we're twenty two now, so that's a good <laughs> amount of time. <laughs> and all of us had Disneyland passes, you know. I mean, I don't know if it's still a cool thing to have a Disneyland pass because you have to mortgage your house to get one. But I mean, but for people, they're like, I don't care, I'm going to pay it because I have to get my fix. But back then, you know, we all had them. And so we would go to Disneyland literally every single week. And my trumpet player, Aaron Bertram, 
he worked for Disney at that time. And he was determined to get our band to audition for Disney somehow. God bless his tenacious attitude and just persistence because, you know, that's like an impossible entity to get into. You think, how can I get into Disney? But he did. Like in some sort of wizard, he got us in. And uh, with that close ties to Disney, we went into our audition as little kids and did the whole four suits sitting in chairs in a white room covered with mirrors in the back lot of Disney. And a bunch of guys going, what are we doing here? I think we're going to get found out. <laughs> we're, we're, we're out of our element. And just played what we did. Uh, we played our, our couple songs and they liked us. And then we went back for a second audition to play inside the park in Tomorrowland Terrace. And so we thought, you know, we love Disney. Why not throw a Disney cover in there? And then so we started playing Under the Sea. And then that kind of turned into our thing. And then we started playing for Disney all the time. We started Downtown Disney. We were the first band to play in Downtown Disney in Orange County when it opened up. And now bands have been playing there forever, but we were the first. And so we thought, why not be more on brand? And we all love Disney. So we started covering a couple of Disney songs just to put them in the set. And we do our own rendition of a, a Scott Disney song, whatever. Now, I think the first one we did was Under the Sea. The first one we did would be, uh, we did our own funny version of Gummy Bears. Oh, cool. <laughs> it's always been kind of a cult classic that if people dig into the internet, the very end of the internet, you'll find our Gummy Bears recording, which was a Disney cartoon and so we started doing that and then then we started touring and we would play the disney songs live we started doing under the sea and can't wait to be king i think those were the first ones we did and uh, when when you're in europe they're very vocal about things they want there and so when we try and sell a cd because we'd hawk cds outside after you know hustling and they go is your disney cover on here and then we got no okay when well i fuck off like <laughs> oh geez that was kind of hostile <laughs> But that's how they talk. They're not really hostile. They're very sweet people. Um, and so we said, you know, we should maybe record it. And then it got to be important. People expected the Disney recordings. And then it just became our thing. We just got, you know, the moniker of being a Disney band. And we're okay with that. It's awesome. It's a badge of honor. I wear it with pride. Well, let's get down to business. Tonight, as I mentioned at the top of the show, Brian and I will be curating a Songs of Disney mixtape. And we're going to use that old cassette deck approach. Brian, as my special guest, will begin side A with his first song choice, and then I'll add a song that I feel best follows up that choice. We'll then flip-flop choosing songs until we've mapped out 10 songs for side A. We'll then give our mixtape a proverbial flip, and we'll map out side B, only this time I'll kick things off with Brian choosing second. Our overall goal for this episode is to craft the best songs of Disney mixtape possible through only 20 songs. At the end of the show, you can take our conversation to the next level by visiting the episode page at myweeklymixtape.com to give our final mixtape a listen via the embedded playlist. And finally, if you like what you're hearing on the show, you can help me out by either telling a friend, leaving the show a five-star review wherever you're tuning in, or becoming a Patreon mixtaper at patreon.com forward slash myweeklymixtape. So, Brian, I'm officially pressing the record button on our mixtape, and the floor is yours. Why don't you dive into the song that you're choosing to kick off side A? Oh, man, I've already taken up enough of your time with my gift of gab that I have. That's not necessarily a gift, but a curse. Uh, the first <laughs> one would be, I have dumb stories attached to each of them. Uh, Friend Like Me from Aladdin. Nice. So, the legends, so everything is traced back to my band, pretty much. We were... I don't know if you remember the Jerry Lewis telethon. Yes. Okay. Jerry Lewis would fly us out every single year to do the telethon. And I mean, you can't see listeners. You can't see this, but I'm showing them. I have a Jerry Lewis tattoo on my arm right there. Nice. Right next to Groucho Marx. <laughs> uh, I grew up being a big Jerry Lewis fan. And so our old manager did a submission and they liked us. And Jerry would call me personally. And I'm a big fan asking me if we would be free to, to do the telethon. And so we did the telethon and then eventually he hired us to play a private party for his daughter's birthday at his house in Vegas. And we'd been working on our next Disney cover, which was Friend Like Me, which is a song that has 35,000 parts. It's like 50 songs in one. And we worked endlessly on this cover, endlessly. And the only time and the first time that we played it was at Jerry Lewis's house for his daughter's birthday. So that is the first, last everything, the only time we've ever played Friend Like Me. And it was at Jerry Lewis's house in Las Vegas. And I took a poop in his bathroom 
And I called my parents. I'm like, you're never going to guess where I'm at. Yeah, yeah, I told you I'm at Jerry Lewis. Yeah, I'm in his bathroom right now. Should I steal the towels? <laughs> well, as soon as I heard the words friend like me, the first thing I thought was, why haven't Suburban Legends covered that song? And now I hear you have. So now I'm going to be sitting back waiting for this version to somehow be recorded in the studio because it can't just be a oh, one-off. The song's too no. amazing. It is amazing, but I don't know if it was amazing when we did it. It was stressful. It was stressful because there's like five songs in it. Yep. But we've been notorious our whole, if you call it a career or whatever, for doing songs like that that have 50 million parts. But if you're a ska band, I mean, when you're younger and you're writing these songs, you don't really know about songwriting. So anything's possible. You know, like now that we're older, we're like, no, you can't do that in a song. But if you listen to our first record or Rum Shake or whatever, it's like... You shouldn't be putting two time signature and keys and everything together like this, but you don't know anything better, you know? So, so you just do it and we did it and it was like that. And I think that it might, might be laid to rest. I don't know if it was amazing, but we got through it. Well, the original to me is so big and so theatrical. It's perfect for Robin Williams, manic kind of vocal delivery as the songs are changing because Robin Williams' character, he would always change and do different voices in his stand-up, and he brought that to the cartoon, which is what I loved so much about this song. You definitely scooped me on the pick. I had that on my list. And I don't know about you, but I kind of think the Will Smith version of the song from the live-action movie was a little hit or miss. I was ready for you to say, Will Smith's version is my favorite, and fight me on that. <laughs> no, I actually love the hip-hop beat behind the song because it really suits Will's delivery. Yeah, totally. But the original is so ingrained in my childhood because of how zany yep. Robin Williams was, it was hard for me to hear it done a different way because I was like... Will Smith was fun, but he didn't have the zany down in that song that it really needed. It was Robin Williams' gig. Like, he was born for that. Exactly. He was born for that. I mean, I don't think anybody else could have done it with that Robin Williams like he did. You know, it was, it was meant to be that ADHD, manic, frenetic energy, switching voices, references. So there was nobody else that could have done it. That's in our DNA. And now I'm going to go with a song to follow that up. Because I had in my list, under friend like me, why haven't Suburban Legends covered this song? This next one oh. <laughs> falls under that category as well. And maybe you have, and maybe I might learn something new tonight. But I'm going to go back to 1988's Oliver and Company. And I'm going to go with a song performed by Billy Joel as Dodger. And I'm going to go with Why Should I Worry? Wow. I absolutely love this tune. And the whole... I hear in horns and in my brain, I'm like, I could hear, you know, a ska band doing this. Now I do want to point out that the original song that was written for Dodger was actually called I'm the greatest and was written by Liberty DeVito, longtime Billy Joel band drummer. But instead of listening to me blabber on about it, go back and listen to hear the full story straight from Liberty's mouth in episode 15, the ultimate Billy Joel playlist, because there was another song, and it's still somewhere in the Billy Joel vault, called I'm the Greatest, that may have made it in this movie. But instead, we got one of my favorite Disney <laughs> songs ever, Why Should I Worry? Oh, man, that was a good pull. I had a dead set, certain songs that I had stories, and like, oh, these songs are important. You know, and then I was, on, I was with, sitting with my five-year-old yesterday, the day before, flipping through Disney going, what other songs? I mean, I know I've got ties to every single thing, but Oliver and Company, I don't think is on Disney Plus. If it was, it wasn't in our queue. I would have totally picked something like that. You're absolutely right. Can I steal that idea and not give you credit? Oh, sure. A hundred percent. As long as you allow me to sing some background vocals that you guys just mix into the final recording. We'll call it even. I'd be upset if you didn't. <laughs> you could just send the tracks. I would be upset if you didn't. I will give you that credit. Rock and roll. Let's make it happen. And now I'm throwing it back to you for track three. All right. Track three is Kiss the Girl from The Little Mermaid. Suburban Legends, obviously, we covered this and we did a video. And the way it came about, because I'm a massive, massive Little Mermaid fan. I remember I have always loved this song and I always thought, God, it'd be great if Suburban Legends did it. But I kind of, I don't normally like, I want to sing this song. I don't really care about that because I'm not the lead singer. 
but this is one I wanted to sing because for some reason I just, I, in my man cave, I have a whole bookcase full of Little Mermaid stuff. And nice. Ursula is my favorite Disney villain. And it's kind of an obscure one, so it's hard to find things by her. But I have a whole bookcase full of it. And I even have the original Little Mermaid Marvel comics when they came out because I'm a massive comic nerd. And so I remember once we were playing in Disneyland, Tomorrowland Terrace. And I thought in my head, you know what? I'm really going to mess with the guys. Because Vince and I, the, the singer in Suburban Legends, we go back and forth. We do banter all the time, tell jokes and stuff. And Vince will always look to me when he doesn't know quite what to say on stage and go, all right, Brian, what do you got to say? And then I went into it just as for fun. And I guess to see what the rest of the band did. And they kicked in and we played a little bit of Kiss the Girl. And at that point, I'm like, ooh, looks like I'm going to get to do the song. <laughs> <laughs> it kind of worked and everybody was singing and it worked out. And for me, you know, I have a really big tie to The Little Mermaid because like we talked about earlier, you know, you and I are roughly around the same age. Mm -hmm. And that when that movie hit, it was so freaking huge. And I was in the YMCA and I remember, yeah, I'm, I was a product of the YMCA big time after school, summer school, summer camp, everything. And I remember that during that summer camp, when that came out on video, that big puffy VHS, you know, the clamshell. Yep. And it had the wiener on the cover. <laughs> you remember that? Yes. I still have that. And I'm a chair <laughs> on the cover. But it, there was, oh, there was one room at the summer camp that had the Little Mermaid playing the whole time you were there, all the time. And then when it was nap time, guess who was playing in the nap time room? Little Mermaid, all the time. And so, you know, everything, just a lot of it goes, Little Mermaid, my favorite. That's it. Well, I love your guys' version of it. Obviously, that was on my short list as well. So great song, great movie. And yes, I had the clamshell VHS yes. tape as well, because that's what all the movies, because they went into the vault. So you had a finite amount of time that you could buy it or else it went away. That's right. It mm -hmm. wasn't on DVD forever. And then I remember we were on tour when it came out on DVD and I was so adamant, like, I got to get two because I got to be able to open one and watch it. And the other, I got to sage. That was stupid because <laughs> they just mass produced it. I still have one somewhere around here in the, the package, but wait, hold on. There's more. So I don't know if you remember back in the day when uh, you'd order movies at the Disney shop in the mall. Yes. And then you'd get a watch and a lithograph and stuff. I just so happened to have, this is purely just accident, but I have the lithographs right here from the VHS from 90 whatever when it came out on VHS. Wow. So what are the odds of just having it right here? <laughs> well, I am going to follow that up with a song from my wife's favorite Disney movie of all time. Something that we had a chance to see together on Broadway and I had a chance to take her to see the original film with our girls with the symphony playing the music from the movie as the movie played. And I'm going to go back to 1964's Mary Poppins, performed by Dick Van Dyke as Bert, the chimney sweep, Step in Time. Whoa. I didn't see that one coming. Good one. Big Broadway-like production. And there's a separate reason why I went with this one as well. Back in the 80s when I was growing up, Disney would put out record albums. Yes, I have some! Oh, snap, dude. So you remember Mouser-Size? Dude, I watched it every freaking morning when they had the exercise outfits. And right after that was Winnie the Pooh, when they had the giant costumes. Yep, it was called Welcome to Pooh Corner. <laughs> wow, I can't believe he said Mouser-Size. Yeah. And they would have Mickey come in and dance with them when they were doing the exercises <laughs> and the spandex. Wow. Thank you for bringing that up. Oh, of course. And with that, the floor is yours for your next pick. Okay, so I did. This is Halloween, Nightmare Before Christmas. Nice. And the reason is, I mean, I we have a lot of ties to Danny Elfman. I'm not a lot of ties, but I mean, our first record, Rump Shaker, for anybody who's never doesn't know who we are, we had an album called Rump Shaker that came out like 2002 or three or four or five or six or something. And it was produced by the bass player of Oingo Boingo. I was always a big Oingo Boingo fan. I went to the farewell tour for Oingo Boingo in 95 or four. And I still have the t-shirt in that drawer right over there. I'm pointing to it like you could see it, but uh, <laughs> that I bought in the parking lot that's at the bottom of my drawer since then. I've never gotten rid of it. It's $5. I used to wear it when I was in middle school and it still fits me now. But uh, 
So the bass player Boingo, Boingo produced that record. And I was obsessed with Nightmare Before Christmas when it came out before it was a hot topic thing. <laughs> and, uh, but the real kicker was when my son got into it. My son, you know, he's five now. And I think he started watching it like three or four. But the thing is, you know, the kid can't remember what I told him to do five minutes ago. But in the span of an hour, he memorized all the lyrics just by watching the, the movie, not rewinding it, knowing the words to that song. I don't know anybody who knows the words to that song. They know, bum, 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 da, 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 and then that's it. <laughs> but he, he, I could bring him in here and go, bones in, bones in, bones in, don't you want to see something strange? So for some reason, that's just so special to me now because that kid is like a freaking sponge and he just absorbed it. And I was just so full of pride when I heard him sing it. And we'd go to the doctor's office for my wife or I, and he would just start singing it. He would just, he's so proud that he learned the lyrics and he, everywhere we went for weeks, he would just start singing it. All I have to do in the car when I'm driving. And then he would stop me and go, dad, no, it's this. Whoa, <laughs> you're already a teenager. <laughs> but uh, yeah, and so that's, that's why I picked that because it's just, for some reason, I just have so much more of a fondness, a new fondness for that movie. Be I mean, I loved it back then, but now I love it for, a once we become adults and we become fathers and wives and mothers and stuff we like things for different reasons and that just brought a whole new touch to my heart because after a while i was kind of sick of it when i saw that it was everywhere it's like check out my aquaphor spread cream with jack skellington on it oh look <laughs> it's my tools that have jack skellington on it It was just everywhere it just kind of takes away from the oh but it was also a good movie before it was a backpack that was a great movie. That stop animation was amazing. Yeah, it was. It was pretty incredible. And that was revolutionary too. love the movie. Love the pick again. That's like that was iconic. That animation that happened at that point. And I feel like the movie at the time was popular, but I feel like it has exploded over the decades Absolutely. to reach levels that I never remember when the movie was actually first out because it, it wasn't there. It was, it was a different time when it wasn't, when older kids weren't celebrating younger kids things. And right. that was seen as a younger kids thing. And so that was just, it was reserved for that. And the select older kids that liked that kind of thing, but you didn't talk about that because it wasn't cool. And now it's like, oh, I'm a nerd. I like Disney. It's like, no, you're not a nerd. You just like <laughs> Disney. It's fine. It's okay. <laughs> All right. Well, following that up, I think we need to go with a problem-free philosophy. Oh, snap. And go back to 1994's The Lion King and go with Hakuna Matata, written by Elton John with lyrics by Tim Rice, performed by Nathan Lane as Timon the Meerkat and Ernie Sabella as Pumbaa the Warthog. I mean, this song is so much fun. When I think of The Lion King, I immediately go to this song Probably because of the fact that Ed doesn't have a song. Because Ed was always my favorite character in The Lion King, but he never had a song. He needs a song. Wait, Ed? Yeah, Ed. Wait, wait, wait. Teacher, I have a... Wait, who's Ed? He was the male hyena. Oh, okay, with Whoopi Goldberg. Okay, it's been a minute. Yeah. I would prefer Whoopi Goldberg. I want to hear what Whoopi Goldberg's song would be. <laughs> <laughs> I am the... Uh, I'm the hyena. That's... I'm the responsible one. <laughs> I mean, of course, if that was the song, it would beat out Hakuta Matata, but unfortunately, it didn't make the final track list. So for the ones that did, Hakuna Matata is just one of those songs. Nathan Lane is so good at his delivery and so good on Broadway, and he brings it to this performance in the cartoon and in so, uh, an otherwise very you know emotional film throughout. This was a moment of levity. And I know that you guys covered a song from the soundtrack as well for your 2012 album Day Job. And I apologize for not picking that one because I love that song, too. But that's OK. Kuda Matana just edged it out ever so slightly. I have a feeling that may pop up later. So I think it's OK. Awesome. So then we're back to you for track seven. I will go back to Tangled. When will my life begin? Ooh, OK. The reason once it, everything's family and band. These days and life, it's tied to life, which is what music ties us to. When will my life begin? I, I just, okay. So a lot of these things I became really, really attached to during COVID because mm -hmm. we were 
I mean, I loved all these movies and everything. And who doesn't love Mandy Moore? And I love Mandy Moore even more because she was married to Ryan Adams. I don't know if you know who Ryan Adams is. You certainly do. Yeah. And I love him. But my family started having, we started culminating these inside jokes. And, you know, when you're quarantined, you, we, we watch, we watch certain movies more than once and we quote them. And the quotes would manifest into some dirty, inappropriate thing to each other. <laughs> That's funny to us. And if anybody else watched, it would be stupid. But my fiance sent me a video of somebody filming a montage with their dog. And I think it was a boxer or something. I don't know. I'm sure someone on the internet will correct me. And it was to this song, but the words were changed to a dog's day. And he'd be like, so I'll wake up now. Then I'll eat my food. I'll poop in the <laughs> yard and lay some more. Then I'll lick my butt. And I'll lick some more. And I wonder, <laughs> will I ever get to eat again? And I wonder, <laughs> will I eat again? And, uh, and we just sang it so much. And it was just so funny. And I was just in there with my lady before this with my son. And I was singing it to them. She goes, babe, that's a good idea. I said, I know. That's why I picked it. <laughs> so that's, that's why I picked it. Great song. That whole soundtrack is fantastic between Donna Murphy's Mother Knows Best. Yes. And at the end, Grace Potter, who's one of my favorite female vocalists, she has something that I want on that soundtrack. That's just an amazing soundtrack all around. Aren't you going to say anything about the contributions of America's Sweetheart, Mandy Moore? Oh, of course. Mandy Moore is absolutely incredible. <laughs> I love her voice. Yeah, she's wonderful. I think I'm going to follow that up with another female voice that's ingrained in my DNA because I have two daughters, one that is in high school and one that is in middle school. You're a brave man. <laughs> I'm not going to argue that. But if you do the math, in 2013, I heard the song Let It Go by Adina Menzel as Queen oh, Elsa. Good. About 5 million times. And as soon as my oldest finally outgrew Let It Go, my youngest daughter came right in and got another four years. So I have had an eight-year run Next of line. hearing Let It Go. And I'll just say it, the song never got old to me. It's a good song. Look, every Disney movie has its big musical moment, and Frozen has a ton of fantastic songs. But let's be honest, Let It Go is that movie's big musical moment. Newfound Glory does a great punk cover of it, so it does kind of creep out into the punk world. But with two girls, how can I not? I wish it? you were wrong. <laughs> I wish you were wrong, but you're not. Sometimes when that song comes up, it's like a, it's like a, a oh God, my, my lady's going to kill me because she's a big house music fan, house head. But you know when the drop comes, it's like do 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 key change. Let it go, let it go. It's like you're waiting for that drop for the key change. You're like, give me the key change. Love that song. <laughs> are you? That's it. You know, it's a good song. It's a great song. I think we talked about covering it, but I shouldn't mention that. Hint, hint, nudge, nudge. I guess we'll have to <laughs> just wait and find out. But with that, we are at track nine. Your last song for side A. What do you got? All right, let's see what we got. Let's do, oh, yes. Beauty and the Beast, the ballad. We recorded it too, and it's not because we recorded it. This came along the time when we were doing Downtown Disney, and it's like right when we were in the midst. It must have been, I think it was before our, even our first record came out, or no, yeah, it was before because we used footage of this one show that I'm about to talk about for our video of a song called High Fives. You know, the ballad, Taylor's oldest time. Mm -hmm. God, it's such a good freaking song. And it hits you and all the lyrics hit you in all those little holes that need to be filled. And like, God, why is this so good? And why can't I write a song like this? But <laughs> also we were doing Downtown Disney so much. And at this point, the Angels were in the uh, World Series or the playoffs for the World Series. And I guess it was a big deal. They hadn't done it in a long time or ever. I don't know. So downtown Disney started getting a little bit more popular because they put a stage out there with a TV so people could watch the games out there. And then all of a sudden they were in the playoffs and they wanted to do a pep rally for the angels. And my best friend, Dave, beep, I did it for you. There you go. <laughs> um, he 
back then it was, it was like before people could put DVD players in their car and he got one in his car and it was awesome. But that's right when the Beauty and the Beast DVD came out. So we were watching it all the time because I was driving to Disney every single day to play. And he and I would carpool because he was best friends with the band. He was he even got naked on MTV during that show Dismissed wearing our shirts <laughs> and singing. He even <laughs> sang a song called Desperate that I wrote and they'd play our music all over it. But uh, so we would watch that movie nonstop. And for some reason, we OK, so Disney set up this massive like it was, it was like a stadium side stage, 40 foot jumbotron. I'm exaggerating, but it may not have been 40 foot, but it was like at least 20 foot jumbotron on this massive stage. They were going to hold a pep rally for the angels. And rumor has it that Queen was supposed to play, I think, with Paul Rogers singing. And we were going to play, and then they were going to play, and then the Angels were going to come up and do their little ceremony. But Queen ended up getting a star on the Walk of Fame. Legend has it that day, so they didn't. So we ended up opening for ourselves in front of ten to 15,000 people on this massive stage. And we're all like 20. And we have like maybe 12 songs. We, we didn't have enough material. We finished our first album when we were in the studio. So repeating a lot of songs and they wanted us to play two like hour and a half sets. <laughs> yeah, it was bad. I mean, it wasn't bad. It was awesome. I mean, it was, it was really cool. And I, I even brought my old man up on stage and he was wearing his cargo shorts and his Birkenstocks and I made him dance in front of 15,000 <laughs> people. It was awesome. And we even used footage from that show for our, we had a sh- song called High Fives. Um, and that, that's the, the footage from that is in there. So for some reason, when I think about that, I think of that song and not my band's version, but just the version from the, the movie and just, just fond memories of that. It was cool. Like I, I'd never played in front of that many people in my life. And I was so nervous and scared I was going to break a string that I couldn't enjoy the moment. Well, that is an awesome song. I took my wife to see that on Broadway. It's a such it's again, it's a big, beautiful song. I, I love the version that Suburban Legends does on Dreams Aren't Real, but these songs are that came out back in 2013. Such a funny P. I'll Thank make you. sure that I embed both the songs that we're talking about from Disney tonight, as well as a separate Suburban Legends playlist for you to check out on the episode page at myweeklymixtape.com. But now talking about these last few songs, which is essentially back-to-back massive Disney ballads. So now I have to close out side A. Okay. And I'm going to do so with a little bit of a loophole, but because it's my show, I can make up the rules as I go along. Because YOLO, right? Yeah, exactly. I am going to go with a song that (laughs) came out in 2011's The Muppets. But if I'm being honest, I'm going back to 1979's The Muppet Movie, which was not a Disney movie, even though they own it now. Written by Paul Williams and made perfect by Kermit the Frog. It's my absolute favorite song ever recorded. I danced with my mom to this song when I was two and three years old. Oh, you're going to make me cry. Come on. I danced with my mom to this song the day I got married. I'm going to call my mom. My mom's in her 70s. I'm going to go dance with her to this song. I danced with both of my girls to this song when they were two and three. And one day, maybe I will dance with both of them when they get married. Brian. I am going with Rainbow Connection because it is the just most beautiful song ever. Me First and the Gimme Gimme does a fun cover of it. And Rivers Cuomo and Haley Williams of Paramore do a good version, but nothing tops Kermit the Frog. What is Brian's version? I don't know if I would ever perform that because I don't know if I'd be able to make it through without getting a lump in my throat. Except for right now. (laughs) Oh, you're going to start. You're going to get, you're going to get misty eyed. If I tried to sing it right now, a hundred percent. Yeah, definitely. Isn't it crazy when you, before you have kids, you like Disney for one reason and then you have kids. And then it's just the whole, like everything doesn't matter anymore. And all that matters is these little moments with your kids and enjoying these Disney songs and movies all over again for a different reason. Oh, I could not agree more with that 100%. And while we're on the topic of my favorite song of all time, I do have to point out that thanks to Record Store Day, they re-released one of the years, the Muppet movie, the original soundtrack. 
My friend Chris, the keyboard player from Colburn and Company, was kind enough to find a copy for me on Record Store Day, so he got it for me, and now I have a sealed vinyl copy of the Muppet Movie soundtrack that I can give to my daughter on her wedding day. Good job, Brian. But then we had another daughter, and with that came the thought, oh crap, now I need to find another copy, and my cousin, thank you, Thank You, Thank You was at a record show out in Pennsylvania, and he found me a sealed original 1979 copy. No way. So I have both of them covered. You were winning as a dad. And you have to understand, I'm taking a big chance right now, gambling on the fact that chances are pretty solid that my kids don't listen to this podcast. But if they do, I am so sorry, honey. I may have just spoiled one of your wedding day presents. (laughs) (laughs) Wow. Good job, dad. I'm leaving my kids a bunch of stupid Gibsons and you're leaving (laughs) a moment in time that was so special to you. And it's like, hey, Jameson, here's a bunch of guitars that your father toured around the world with. But I didn't give you a Muppet soundtrack field because I don't have anything special to give you. Jeez, I got to. All right. I got to go. I got to go rethink my parenting. (laughs) Well, there you have it, folks. Side A of our Songs of Disney mixtape, which consists of Friend Like Me from Aladdin, Why Should I Worry from Oliver and Company, Kiss the Girl from The Little Mermaid, Step in Time from Mary Poppins, This is Halloween from The Nightmare Before Christmas, Hakuna Matata from The Lion King, When Will My Life Begin from Tangled, Let It Go from Frozen, Beauty and the Beast from the movie of the same name, and Rainbow Connection from The Muppets. Head over to MyWeeklyMixtape.com to hear all the songs we've discussed in this mix through the playlist embedded on the episode page. Now, Brian, while we have you here, I was thinking we've been talking about Suburban Legends' Disney connection tonight a lot, but not about the band's original ska punk tunes, so I want to remedy that for a second. Before we started recording tonight's episode, I put together a list of five songs that I feel best define Suburban Legends musical legacy. And so now what I'd like to do is ask you the question, what five songs do you feel best define Suburban Legends musical legacy so we can see where we align and where we differ? Okay, so you're asking my favorite five songs they don't necessarily have to be your favorite ones that you feel define the band's musical legacy oh okay so it's a little bit of a different spin than the choose between your children question no i got this i got it so it'd be bright spring morning probably doc kales maybe our it's a newer song but people seem to like it worry on my mind um high fives obviously God, what would be another one? Uh, John, <laughs> it's got to be there. Come on, Brian. If only you were in the band. <laughs> Look around your room. Maybe there's some things to fudge. Um, can you give me a hand? Throw me something. I need one more. <laughs> Dude alert. All right. Well, that one speaks to the hairband fan of me for sure. Love it. And I have a signature guitar pedal coming out by a company called Rude Tech. And it's going to be available. The the same company did, you know, the band, the Aquabats. Oh, of course. So they did it. Eagle Bones, Ian, did a signature pedal with them. And it's the same company doing it for me. And it's a doodler pedal based on a pedal that I built 13 years ago and has never been able to duplicate. But everyone's always like, what is that pedal? And I just go, I don't know. I just soldered it. I don't, I don't know what I'm doing. <laughs> but, but anyway, so doodler. Yes, because it's like a, a slowed down version of Kickstart My Heart with Horns. Yes, it's a friggin' awesome one. Oh, thank you. Okay, well, that's my five. Great list. And I'm going to vary it up a little bit with some of my picks here. So I like where we're going. My five, we were in lock with high fives from 2003's Rum Shaker. I'm going with This Cherry from 2006's Dance Like Nobody's Watching. I love that song. That song's so much fun to play. It rocks. It rocks. Just Be Happy from 2012's Day Job. So many people, we lied for doing Disney and stuff. We censored that song. You know, so it says, don't be a motherfucker. Yes. We changed it to don't eat my chicken fingers. (laughs) And so everybody in the crowd says, don't, 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 don't eat my chicken fingers. And everybody sings that, but they all smile knowing it's don't be a motherfucker. And so people have said, are you ever going to do your censored version? 
no one's no one ever asked for a band. Can you please release your censored version? Because I like that one a lot too, <laughs> as well. Sorry, go ahead. No problem. Then I'm going to go off of, because I bought this CD in 2010, the 2010 Going On Tour EP, Dance, Dance, Dance. Oh, yeah, we still play that song, and that's the only way you can get it is on that. <laughs> yes. Good one. And then I'm going to go back to Day Job, and I'm going to go with Whoa for my last song. All right. Those are all good ones that I, I like playing too, Brian. So you, you, are, you have my heart. Fantastic. Now, in 2009, the band collaborated with MC Lars and a band you just mentioned, the Aquabats MC Bat Commander, on the Nerdcore Ska Classic, This Gigantic Robot Kills. And then in 2015, you teamed up with Lars along with Roger Lima of Less Than Jake on Sublime with Rome is Not the Same Thing as Sublime. Can you talk about how those Nerdcore collaborations came together? Because... Ska Nerdcore really works well together. You know, we're all just people, so it, it should all just work together and just, but unfortunately, everybody has to be in genres and stuff. So, but it came about because we took Lars on tour with us twice in the US and I think once in the UK. And I'm a massive, massive, massive hip hop head. And you may not know that by anybody who, follows the band or anything, but that's primarily what I listen to. I'm just, that's hip hop has probably saved my life so many times. And so Lars and I always had a lot of intelligent conversations about hip hop because Lars is a very, very, very smart guy. And by the way he talks and his banter, you, I mean, I'm sure you can gather it, but he's a very deep thinker. He's incredibly yes. intelligent. And he just said, Hey, I got this song and would you help me with it? And so he, I think he and I, I don't know. I'm not sure if Joe from Pat and Penny, I think Joe worked on it with us too. And we wrote it at my band's warehouse. Um, it, Vince and I and Lars, and I, I think I want to give Joe credit because I think he was there or he had a hand in it. But what L Lars did there was pretty much a masterpiece helping out the Scossi, pointing out like, hey, we never left and we, we're still here and we're still fun. And, you know, when you feel like it's cool to like us again, come on back. <laughs> Scott is not dead. <laughs> God, exactly. Scott, you wait, hold on one second. Ah, oh, dude, Brian, I'm so freaking prepared for this interview. It's not even funny. Look at this. Nice. And guess what it says on the back, Brian? Scott is not dead. I absolutely or, or, love wait, it. Are you seeing it as C X Tom <laughs> Dead? Is that what it looks like to you? I do, bro. I was so ready for this. I'm awesome. Well, while we're on the topic of collaborations, I do want to bring up one more track from 2012's Day Job, and that's the closing song, Can't Stop It, that features Lyrics Born, another amazing hip-hop artist. This yes. one just missed my top five because it's so ridiculously catchy, and I'm kind of oh, curious good. how that collaboration came together and if the band has ever considered a full-on crossover album with a hip-hop artist because all three collaborations i've talked about tonight are so damn good oh brian you're just tickling me right now without <laughs> your hands you're just doing it through my ears dude okay so i've been a lyrics born fan and a lyrics fan like i said i'm hip-hop is my life and it's i can't even stress that enough how important it is to me and how well, we talked about my stuff and you know working with kids and reading and how hip-hop mcs were the first to in the streets to say knowledge is power read you know and then that's how you empower yourself and i've taken that mentality working with kids but anyway i love lyrics born i think he's a smart incredible lyricist and we played a festival with him and the god this touches home at so many points so we played with him and i was so excited to see him because i love lyrics born i love lyrics and he came up to me afterwards and he's like, dude, that was really good. I'm like, okay, well, I'm a fan. So thank you. <laughs> and, uh, and we, we watched a little bit. I was, I was nervous. Like I, I did, we met so many cool people and everything, but I, I don't get starstruck that often, but somebody I really respect and like, and comes up to me and says, I really like your band. I'm like, oh, well, thank you. And then, <laughs> uh, had a little liquid courage at the end of the festival that we played. It was in Modesto too. <laughs> when does Modesto make relationships happen? But it did. And I said, hey, man, we have a track that we're looking for an MC on. Because I originally wanted to hit up Charlie Tuna from Jurassic 5. Mm -hmm. 
I said, hey, would you be interested in doing a track? He said, take down my information right now. Yes, yes. And so I took it down and another guy came up to me, his drummer said, hey, man, you're a ska band. I said, yes, we are. <laughs> and he said, have you ever heard a band called Big D and the Kids Table? And he said, yes, I actually used to play guitar for Big D and the Kids Table. And he goes, oh, that's funny. So did I. I used to play drums for them. Long story long, that dude ended up filling in in Suburban Legends on drums a couple times for Disney shows and out of town stuff and playing in my blues band. But so that was just another connection. And so we just kept in touch with him. And then when the track was done, sent it to him and he came back with that. And I'm just so, and every once in a while, I'll get a text from him like, hey man, I got this new record. Can you post it on your, on your socials to promote your bands? And I'm just thinking, yes, lyrics born, whatever you want. <laughs> yes, Tom, because we're friends now. <laughs> So yeah, that's how it came about. And I, I would love, I, oh my God, I would love to, love to, Brian, to have more hip hop MCs because I really want to get Charlie Tuna from J5. And, you know, when uh, I used to be in a band called The English Beat, I don't know if you, I'm sure you know who they are, but I used to play guitar oh, for him. Yeah, Dave Wakeling. Yeah, exactly. I, he was my boss. <laughs> um, and they always have a thing called a toaster, which is almost the guy that is like a hype man, but also raps. And yep. I'm thinking that's almost like hip hop and ska, but why can't you do them both? I would love to contact hip hop MCs and have them guest on ska songs. If that were even a possibility to have, I that would be a dream collaboration come true to do a record of that. I would never miss a second in the studio because that's like I said, that's my lifeblood is hip hop. Awesome. Well, I want to mention one other cover song because I am a fan of cover songs that's outside of Disney tunes. And I'm going to go to your 2015 album, Forever in the Friend Zone. The band covered Andrew Gold's Thank You for Being a Friend. And if those out there listening are wondering what that, why that song sounds so familiar, it's probably because they're more familiar with Cynthia Fee's cover, which serves as the theme song to the Golden Girls. Yes. I'm curious what the band's criteria is in choosing cover songs. Is it personal connections, songs that you know the fan base will like, or something entirely different? Uh, you know what it comes right down to? Vince and I going, oh my God, I love this song. Or he'll just, <laughs> I'll send a video to him. Or, I mean, you're a father, so I'm sure you watched Bluey at some point. Oh my God, yeah, I've seen Bluey. <laughs> and, oh yeah, God, that's the perfect show for a parent because everything just speaks to the parent and then you'd like it too. But uh, I mean, I could just say like, Vince, why haven't we covered the Bluey soundtrack? And then five minutes later, I'll get a track to play on. Do it. I already set it up. Come on, let's do it quick, quick, quick. You know, we cover what we like. Because I, I don't know if you, if you, how much you've dove into our catalog, but we have a lot of songs about friendship, mm -hmm. you know, and that's the main reason why we're still doing it because we stopped touring so heavily and it's an excuse for you to see my best friends. Because everybody has lives, families, wives, and kids and all that stuff. And, you know, it's like the only chance we get to see each other and have fun and play music together, which is why we all became best friends in the first place. Because, see, my band are my best friends. So I, I've toured with so many bands and had a great time with them. But just touring with your best friends is such an incredible treat and gold. That's why we have stayed together for so long. And so we've written all these songs about friendship. And Vince sent me this song. And I think he sent me another Andrew Gold song too. I was like, this is so good. He goes, well, guess what? He did the Golden Girls theme and he sent me that. And I think we said, dude, we need to cover this. Oh, we sing so many songs about friendship and this is like the perfect one. And so that's how the, there's the, the criteria for a cover song for Suburban Legends is personal relation. Will we make it funny? Does it need to be funny? And do we feel compelled to cover this? It's awesome. got to have some sort of relation and hit home somehow with us. And every single cover song we have has hit home. We're not doing it just to do it. It's got a story behind it. And there's not enough time in the podcast to talk about them all. Well, as somebody who's seen Suburban Legend several times over the years when you've been out in New Jersey, it definitely shines through in the band's music. So I absolutely love it. Oh, I'm glad. Well, now we're going to flip over to side B and I get to kick things off tonight. And I am going to start off side B with a very big show stopping song from a movie we've already talked about. So let us pull up a chair as the dining room proudly oh, that's presents. That's the one I was going to pick, Brian. That's the one I was going to pick. Can I just say it, please? 
Absolutely. Or should I say, be my guest? <laughs> be our guest? Hell yeah. We were supposed to cover that, Brian. <laughs> yeah, I'm so upset that I didn't pick that because on this record, that was going to be one of the ones that I was going to sing. Oh my God, really? Yes. I love that song. So many times people will say something like, is this good? And I'll go, try the gray stuff. It's delicious. Don't believe me. Ask the dishes. They could sing. They could dance. After all, this is friends. We're service here is never second best. Go ahead and take a glance. And you'll be okay. Sorry. Not at all. When the music hits. <laughs> it's so good. Absolutely. Love that song. And one of my favorite things to do at Disney is the Mickey's Philharmagic in Walt Disney World, where they do the 4D cartoon and they literally do this song and it's coming out of the screen and you smell the pie as they're oh, holding man. it out. It's so wild. Why are you so... telling me this? You haven't seen that one yet? It's Oh, dude, it's incredible. Mickey's Philharmagic. The only time that we do the Disney Florida is when we're on tour and someone signs us in there. We've never played Disney Florida, but I love it so much. But I'm just so glad that you picked the Be Our Guest because that is, I, that should have been on my freaking list. <laughs> you stole it, Brian. Well, I am passing the mic back to you now to follow it up with something that is on your list. All right. This is, there's not a whole like story behind this, but it's just a great song. The Encanto Surface Pressure. Nice. You know, well, I don't want to drip, 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 do another go. Whoa. During the summer, I teach first through fifth. I, I work at a writing school where I teach first through fifth where the kids get to write and publish their own book and illustrate by the end of it. Oh, awesome. It's really cool. And uh, that's when the Encanto came out. And there was a kid in my class named Bruno. So every time he get called, everyone says, we don't talk about Bruno. And then <laughs> he'd always get bombed. And so I'd always switch the, the narrative to, I'd immediately go into, yeah, that song's great, but what would the pressure win it? And I'd mess up the lyrics just to piss off the kids. And they go, no, that's not how it goes. <laughs> and, I, and I go, yeah, I'm the adult. And I'm telling you, that's how it goes. But the song, <laughs> the way it's structured, the lyrics, the melody, the story, how it goes up, and then it gets all sensitive with her, and it's just a great song. I love that song. I think the music in that movie was perfect. I mean, obviously, Lynn manuel Miranda just does so much. It's like lyrical acrobatics. So I obviously had We Don't Talk About Bruno on my list as well because it kind of brought the whole ensemble in, and that song became like a moment the way let it yeah. go became a moment but i'm glad that this movie's represented because musically it's probably one of the stronger one i mean you know, the recent ones yes absolutely yes. and the story in the movie is just great the family aspect and everything about it is great and like you said the the bruno thing was a moment in time for people and i'm going like hey but what about the pressure song remember when she <laughs> grabbed the donkeys come on that's good too Unbelievable. Well, I am going to go now. You went with a newer movie, so I'm going to go way back. And I'm not even going to go with a movie. I'm going to go with a song that was featured in a Disney cartoon short. But it's still one of my favorite Disney tunes ever. And it has been featured on a soundtrack for Disney's House of Mouse. The cartoon is called In the Bag, and it's from 1956. And the song is called The Humphrey Hop. I don't believe you. I'm checking it right now. If that song doesn't sound familiar, it's first you stick a rag, put it in the bag, bump, bump. Then you bend your back, <laughs> put it in the sack, bump, bump. That's the way it's done. It's a lot of fun, bump, bump. Cutting capers, putting papers in the vat. And it's just this stupid cartoon with all these bears cleaning up the park and the ranger is singing this song counting them in and they're all dancing and cleaning up and i watched this cartoon so many times when the disney channel was playing cartoon shorts in the 80s growing up and this one was always one of my favorites so that is my i usually go with a deep pick i'll be very curious how many disney fans out there remember that one so if you do make I'm sure i'm trying out. to bring it up on disney right now is it even on disney plus well, it's definitely on YouTube, so what I'll do is I'll embed it over on the episode page at myweeklymixtape.com in case anybody out there hasn't seen it. Well, I grew up having the Disney Channel back, like you said, like we talked about earlier with the Jazzercise and Mousercise, because mm -hmm, mm -hmm. my old man owned and operated a cable construction company for like 50 years. 
And oh, so wow. we used to get free cable all the time. So I'd watch Disney Channel nonstop. And they had, uh, do you remember the Disney Sunday movie? Oh, yeah, of course. Sorry, this is a, a trip down memory lane for me. This no was, problem. Like, our moment of time that we had with Disney is going to be completely different than our kids. Of course. And which is, I mean, it's awesome because our special time is, you know, what we had and we're remembering it fondly. And they, maybe they'll remember this special time fondly. I don't know. I hope they do. Completely agree. So I took it a little deep. We're talking Disney, so that's not a problem because usually heavier moments are followed by moments of levity. And with that, we're back to you for our next pick. Okay, well, why don't we do the Toy Story You Got a Friend in Me? Nice. Because, I mean, obviously the band did a video for it, and I think that's one of our funnier videos where I get pregnant with my friend <laughs> Vince's baby from a high five. So you know, if you don't have an allergic reaction to latex, then you should start <laughs> wearing a glove when you give somebody a high five because you can get pregnant. Um, <laughs> but uh, I was a big Toy Story fan back when, in the mid-90s when it came out, like 94, 95? 95, yep. I, once again, I told you when I ordered the lithic, when I pre-ordered the stuff at Disney for the videos, the puffy cases, the clamshell cases, mm -hmm. I did that for Toy Story. I think I got all the Burger King toys and my son, God, I, I got one from Burger King that you press the button on Woody's chest and it says, you're my favorite deputy. And it's actually Tom Hanks voice. You know, you don't get the real voices anymore. And right. so that was what? how many years ago and the battery still works i have a five-year-old and the battery still works <laughs> and I, I so i ordered it and it came with the lithographs and it came with a buzz light your watch and i actually have the buzz light your watch right there so yeah i was a big big toy story fan and i was in eighth grade we took a class trip to disney and i said all i want to do is just buy as much toy story stuff as i can and i still have an alien Still in the package on my wall that every time my son comes in my man cave, dad, can I have it? Nope. Okay. <laughs> right against Bob, dad, can I have it? Nope. Okay. But I've given him a lot of my old Toy Story toys, except that one. He's not going to touch that one. Maybe on his wedding day. <laughs> no, no, no. He's going to get a, uh, he's going to get a, a Mary Poppins one. There you go. <laughs> <laughs> Well, I mean, obviously, Randy Newman classic. That song, as soon as you hear the opening notes, you know exactly what movie it is. And when it first came out, Pixar was separate from Disney. And this was this yeah. new kind of like, what is this? This is Hot so animation. different. And it, yeah, it was so different than what was out there. And it was so iconic. And the fact that they've been able to keep such a strong narrative through three sequels really yep. speaks to the volume. Like when you know you're getting a Toy Story... They never really slip down from the first no, one. No, they've never, they, you know what you're going to get. You know, you're going to have the feels, you know, you're going to have the funny, you know, you're going to guess about the new voices and you're okay with the message. You can watch that movie a thousand times, any one of them, find new things and you can watch it with your kid as many times as you want. And I doubt you'll get sick of it. I once during COVID, my missus was miss, working from home and I wasn't working because COVID. And so it was, I was with them all day. So I said, I would go and say, hey, dude, guess what we're going to do? We're going to do all four Toy Story movies. And you know what? To this day, one of my favorite ones is the dinosaur one. Have you ever seen the, the dinosaur short? Yes. Oh, it's so freaking good. It's so good. Anyway, so I just, I, I have a very fond attachment. I bought the soundtrack when it came out when I was in eighth grade. I bought all the toys and the fact that my band gets to cover it. And then on top of that, I told you I do. I read to kids at the library. I'm an, an employee of the city of Huntington Beach for doing story tanks for kids. Mm -hmm. And that's one of the songs I, I sing. And more often than not, the parents are the ones that are singing loud in the crowd than the kids. Of course. That's that's our music. That touched our little, <laughs> yeah, exactly. I'm like almost playing to them. And the kids are just like, all right, mom and dad, get your song over with. <laughs> well, following that up, I'm going to go back about 20 years to a movie that I grew up with a lot watching, renting a lot from the VHS store, from the video store growing up as a kid. And that is The Jungle Book. And I'm going to go with a song that was performed by Phil Harris as Baloo and Bruce Reitherman as Mowgli. And I'm going with The oh, Bear Necessities. Necessities. Have you heard Bowling for Stoops cover? Oh, that's exactly what I was just going to say. Their cover is so freaking amazing. Dude, they did it. <laughs> 
<laughs> I wanted the legends to cover it. And then I remember seeing it on on uh, Disney because I used to listen to Radio Disney and watch Disney Channel a lot. They used to play our stuff on Radio Disney in the background. Yes. But that song, they did such a great cover. We toured with Bowling for Soup and I didn't even mention it to them. I should have. Oh man, their cover of that is fantastic. And that's exactly why there's that punk element to the song that I love their cover so much. I would always play that version for my kids because it's like, hey, you know, the, yeah. some of dad's music's cool too. Look, see, dad's music likes Disney too, you know? <laughs> yeah, that's, you know, that's another reason why we did our Disney covers and an album because so many of our fans have kids now and they all say like, can you make a Disney record so I can play it for my kids? Because I can't play all of your record stuff for my kids. And we're like, yes, we should. <laughs> and we did. I'm bummed that they got to it before us, but they did a good job covering it. They did a great job, definitely. And now I'm going to throw it back to you to follow that up with your next pick. All right. Let's see. Um, all right. So this is another song that I so badly wanted to cover. And it's almost like 50 songs in one. And once again, it goes back to my favorite movie, Little Mermaid. And I just love Ursula. Her attitude and her swagger, her voice. Like maybe she used to smoke for 40 years. <laughs> Poor Unfortunate Souls. Awesome tune. It's such a good song. And I just remember being a little kid. Like I told you when I was at YMCA in the, the nap room. And it's just like me and my friend would, when we're taking naps and we'd be like, it's all about language <laughs> and makes leverage. You know, and it's just like those little quotes and just, it's just a great song, a great, great song. And I love it. I wish we covered it, but alas, it wasn't in the cards, but I love that song. And there's still plenty of time. Maybe it is in the cards for the future. Who knows, right? We talked about doing a Disney covers record of doing one side happy and the other side villains. I probably shouldn't be saying that now just in case we do it sometime, but yeah. <laughs> <laughs> if you do end up doing it, then I got a scoop on my show, so I'd be pretty happy about that. <laughs> Absolutely. Well, two songs ago, we had a song that Bowling for Soup covered that you wish you covered. Then you followed it up with a song that you wish you covered. I'm going to follow <laughs> up Poor Unfortunate Souls with a song that you did cover and is one of my favorites, and it's a theme song because you cannot talk about Disney music and not talk about the theme from DuckTales. So I am dropping oh, that. You're just, all right. <laughs> Looks like I have to scrape that off my list. Thank you, Brian. Good one. I mean, you mentioned it when you talked about your five songs that you feel describes Suburban Legends. I love your version of it so much. The original, again, it hits every nostalgia point because we watched DuckTales after school growing up. And the song is yeah. so catchy. And even as adults... We love this song and it's something that the kids get into and parents and kids can relate to. And I love going back and watching the reruns of the old show with my kids and they brought it back for a new generation, even though I'm partial to the original. You're absolutely right. The, the new one is good, but the original is it has the heart. Yes, that's the, you, you'd hit the nail on the head. So have to throw in the DuckTales theme here. Yeah, definitely. So with that song, that was almost like one of our sleeper hits. That's one of our in the millions that stream. And we, we didn't know that it was going to be that big of a hit. We would just, a lot of these songs we didn't do because they think that people would be like, we'd get the streams or anything. We're just like, wow, we just really like this song. And it's a vehicle to perform the song. Same with Kiss the Girl. I always loved that song. I always wanted to do it. And the band was a vehicle to do it. And same with DuckTales. And Aaron Bear from Real Big Fish did the guitar solo on that. And the thing that hurts, the thing that cuts is everyone's like, oh, that's such a good solo on DuckTales. And all I can go is, thank you. I can't say <laughs> anything else after that. Just thank you. <laughs> He's a better guitar player than I am. <laughs> Ow. So that's my story about DuckTales. I love it. Well, now I'm throwing it back to you. We're at the home stretch here. We only got a few songs left. So what do you have for track eight? Okay, well, I'm going to have to cut down my list because DuckTales was on there. <laughs> but so let's do Can't Wait to Be King, obviously, because of Lion King. That was the second one of our two Disney songs that we released and that people would just go ape shit for. When anybody asked, like, oh, send me a video of your band. I sent them a video of us playing Can't Wait to Be King at the Forum in London in front of like 2,500 people dancing to Can't Wait to Be King because it makes me look cool. And you know the song. So you go, oh, I like this song. I know the song. Oh, 
people must think his band's popular, even though we, they were there for Real Big Fish. They weren't there for us. <laughs> maybe, maybe two of them were. So my trombone player, Brian Robertson, he and I don't agree on anything. It's almost like a brother-brother relationship where we butt heads all the time. And the two things that we've ever agreed on that we both like, everything else is like, no, 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 we butt heads. But it's, it's brotherly love. One would be that we both like Waterworld and nobody else likes it. And that and the other one is The Lion King. That's the only things that we've ever agreed on in our entire life. Everything is no, 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 no. And I even saw that on Broadway nice. many, many moons ago. And it was phenomenal. And to see how they did it and they brought it to live action. And just the songs are just, the songs are really good. And the heart in that movie, everything, it just tugs on the heartstrings, especially being a father and wanting mm -hmm. to see your kids succeed. So that's what I got. All right. I absolutely love the song. I had went with Hakuna Matata on side A, but I love the fact that you got this in here because I love your cover, which was on 2012 well, Day you. Job. I think you guys do an amazing version of it. That's again in my list, but I wanted to, during the middle of the episode, talk about your original tune. So I'm glad we we're able to get this one in here. And now for my last song of the night, it's going to double up as my last pick. But it's also going to be a humble request that maybe you guys consider this one going forward because I could completely hear a ska cover version of this song. And I'm going to go back to 2016's Moana and I'm going to go with Dwayne The Rock Johnson as Maui and I'm going to go with You're Welcome. Oh, dude, I can't believe I missed that one. I'm so glad you did, Brian. That's, that's, that's the jam right there. It's okay to say you're welcome. I swear to God, when that first came on Disney Plus, my daughter kept saying, can we watch that song again? Can we watch that song again? And I was like, sure, because it's so catchy. Yeah. I never got sick of it. And that would make such a per... I could hear the horns. I could hear everything oh, of this song being a ska punk song. So that's my last pick of the night. You're welcome. You're welcome, I guess. <laughs> You know what? That didn't go unthought of on our part. I kept on thinking, like, how could we cover that song? And plus, I'm a massive wrestling fan. And so I love The Rock, even though The Rock is The Rock and he's great by himself, but he's also an incredible wrestler. Mm -hmm. And it's amazing that I've found someone to procreate with because I have a room full of, like, wrestling stuff and comic books and Disney stuff. I'm in a man cave right now <laughs> that's surrounded by Disney, comic books, Kiss, and music gear. So, but yes. So that means I have two more, huh? No, yeah, there's one song left. Oh, shoot. I ran out of fingers to count on. Okay, so <laughs> I'm going to talk about kind of introing our new single. We did Eye to Eye from Goofy Movie. Yes. I think we all grew up with Goofy Movie, the first one. And I just even as much as recently, I was watching it with my son. And, you know, when they're getting ready to go on this BS vacation that, you know, Max doesn't want to go on. And Goofy's like, what do you think, Max? He's like, oh, God, Dad, I just want to get to the Powerline concert. <laughs> well, my son, this guy right here, I'm like, can you see him? Yes, I can. Okay, I told you he'd make an appearance. Um, he's like, Dad, I don't think I ever want to go on a vacation like this with you. And then at the end of the movie, he goes, Dad, I want to go on a vacation like this with you. It's like, <laughs> like, all right, I'm done. I'm done. Parenting, you're doing it right. <laughs> exactly. And it's, it's like, that's what I was coming back to before about, Disney having an effect on you in so many different aspects of your life. Like as a kid, you love Disney in one way. As an adult, you love Disney in a different way. As a partner, you love Disney in a different way. As a father, a mother, you love Disney in a different way. You have different reasons to love these things. And I think we all love Goof Troop. 100%. Dude, goof Troop. Represent. And what I'm going to do is instead of chiming in, I've received permission in advance to play a clip of Eye to Eye from the Suburban Legends. How dare you? Did you get it from Pirate Bay? Napster? <laughs> Did someone post it on MySpace? <laughs> it was uh, somebody <laughs> sent it to me via AIM. That's legit then. I'll, I'll accept that. All right. Well, then enjoy this clip of Eye to Eye from Suburban Legends. One way or another, get us where we both belong. Eye to eye. 
And with that, Mixtapers concludes side B of our Songs of Disney mixtape, which consists of Be Our Guest from Beauty and the Beast, Surface Pressure from Encanto, Humphrey Hop from the short In the Bag, You've Got a Friend in Me from Toy Story, The Bare Necessities from The Jungle Book, Poor Unfortunate Souls from The Little Mermaid, The DuckTales theme from DuckTales, I Just Can't Wait to Be King from The Lion King, You're Welcome from Moana, and I to I from the Goofy Movie. Head over to MyWeeklyMixtape.com to hear all the songs we've discussed in this mix through the playlist embedded on the episode page. Now, Brian, looking into Suburban Legends Crystal Ball, is there anything that fans can look forward to in the coming months? Maybe, I don't know, another Disney theme song cover or something? Brian, these are very in-depth captivating questions you're asking <laughs> and we're doing the darkly duck theme song yes yeah we're doing that we did it uh, we did, i mean i'm sure we all grew up I mean, some of us grew up with darkly duck and we did an awesome interesting ska metal take on the theme song oh i can't wait to hear that we've got some more gems coming out after that too so stay tuned i cannot wait and earlier you were talking about something where you read for young kids and you do something called rock and roll reading can you just kind of let people know a little bit about that and how they can learn more. Yeah. Uh, and you can find rock and roll reading on, on Facebook and where I'm performing and you can find rock and roll reading on YouTube. Just, I have like two kids music videos, like Chris Grau. I think you guys have talked to him on the other podcasts. Yes, he sir. did a video for one of my songs called big old gorilla. And that's just where I trying to get kids to read, trying to get parents to find a way to get their kids to put down the tablet. I know it's a necessary evil, but put it down for a second, spend a minute, read to them because we all remember what it was like to have our parents read to us. Don't remember what they said, but you remember how it felt. And so I, every Friday in front of 150 kids, I read books and play guitar and I have a little Britney Spears wireless mic and I run around and try and make the parents laugh and the kids laugh and read books to them. And hopefully the parents will go, wait a minute, this guy's a clown. We could do this at home. And then maybe they go <laughs> try and recreate it at home. And that's, I'm a city employee of Huntington Beach to do that. So unbelievable. Well, Brian, this has been such a fun discussion tonight. Thank you so much for joining me on my weekly mixtape. Oh, thank you for having me on your weekly mixtape. I'm going to continue listening and being a fan. So thank you for having me. And to everyone listening, remember you can find my weekly mixtape on almost all the social media haunts at my weekly mixtape. You can also head to myweeklymixtape.com to check out the full catalog of my weekly mixtape episodes. And if you like what you're hearing on the show, you can help me out by either telling a friend, leaving the show a five star review wherever you're tuning in, or by becoming a Patreon mixtaper at patreon.com forward slash my weekly mixtape. That's all for this week. Thanks again for listening. And until next time, enjoy the tunes. Hey folks, Stefan Shirazi and Renee Richardson here from the Metallica Report. And we are proud members of the Pantheon Podcast family, where the best of music and podcasts unite. We've got something pretty cool for you. We're giving away an exclusive Metallica merch package worth over $250. That's a whole lot of scary guys, skulls, M72, and other sought-after Metallica swag. And we've made it easy for you to win. Follow and share the Metallica Report, and you're in the game. Go to pantheonpodcast.com slash Metallica, enter your email, and hit that button to be entered to win. And just like that, you're eligible for our monthly exclusive Metallica merch package. And guess what, rockers? You can enter every month. So just do it. And while we love our global brothers and sisters, the lawyers won't let us ship outside the U.S.